ask uh, Cameron if he won't open us up in prayer. Sure. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity. We may be joined together with brethren in Christ and to, to share your word. We ask that you prepare our heart and our spirit and our, and our soul and our mind for the message you would have uh, us to receive this day. We ask an anointing on Dickie so that he will he will teach in a way that each person can understand in their individuality and they can take it and run with it this day, Lord. We just praise you and thank you. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord. We ask for our blessing on those who are not able to be here with us to stay. We ask for a blessing on those who are, are with us to stay this day through the means of technology, Lord. We just ask that uh, you bless us this day, that you watch over us, that you be even God and correct us. So the things we say, the things we do, the very thoughts we have, the very actions we take will be pleasing and bring honor and glory to you and your kingdom. Praise you, Lord, and thank you for Jesus in our life. In Christ, told you, amen. 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 Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about uh, um, the, the uh, overcoming uh, kingdom that we live in now and, and how that uh, uh, the victory that the children of Israel received at Jericho, how it relates to us today. Uh, in other words, everything in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of what was coming in Christ. So we have uh, the Word of God that is new, and the Bible says it's new every morning. And the Word that comes to us is new every day. In other words, it's uh, the manna that the children of Israel ate in the desert God provided every day, that, that manna they went out every day picked up that God gave them uh, was new every day. And it would not last overnight. And if you try to gather way more and say, I'm not going to have to go out tomorrow and gather, it, would, it says it would be rotten and have worms in it. In other words, God is trying to get us to understand that the Word of God to us and for us is new every morning. And because of that, we have an opportunity every day to hear God, not just in some word that He's spoken years ago, but in His word for us now. His word for us now. What is a now word? What's a now word? A now word is God speaking to me this morning and saying, this is the day that I've created for you. And I want you to rejoice and be glad in it. I want you to understand that that, that I made this day and that I created you and that I have a purpose for you to fulfill during this day. In other words, every person has a purpose. Every person, God, God created a plan and a purpose for us before the foundation of the earth. Before we ever saw earth, before we ever came here, he said, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. So God had a, a pre-planned purpose for our life and Everything that God has for us is good because God is a good God. He's a loving God. So what interferes? And that's what we're talking about today. This, this road to victory the children of Israel took, they didn't know it was a road to victory as they were going through it because it was filled with all kinds of things, with giants and uh, uh, distractions and things that came to uh, pull them away from the things of God. So in understanding what God is trying to do in us, He's trying to bring us into a place where we will walk with Him, but walk with Him in a flow. In a flow. In a flow. In other words, we want to get into that move of God where we're not struggling every day, trying to hold on. You know, do you ever feel like you're just holding on? You, you, there's, a, there's a rope there and you're holding on and saying, I'm not going to let go, God. Well, God wants you to enter into that place and come in every day with that new mountain. That word from God, that word that says, I created you and I love you, and I loved you with an everlasting love, and I will love you forever, ever, ever more. And nothing's ever going to change that. Uh, we've talked about this before. The first time that Jesus saw Peter, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, but you shall be called Petra or Peter, which by interpretation are wrong. And he saw Peter finished. You understand? He, saw, he didn't see Simon. He saw Peter. He said, 
I know that's who you are now, but he said, you're going to be a rock. You're going to be a rock because I see you finished. I'm not looking at you the way you're looking at yourself this moment. I'm looking at you, at you in a finished product, a finished work. And so when we come into that understanding, God sees us finished. And so his purpose and plan for us is to walk into that place where we are a finished work. We are a finished product. And in that, he has a plan. Now, the children of Israel uh, started out, and they, of course, they walked in the desert for 40 years. All those who, who were over 20 years old died before they ever entered the promised land because they, they were full of unbelief. Now, what, what causes us to believe? What causes us to believe? Does uh, seeing miracles cause us to believe? Well, I would say faith would probably be what causes us to believe. Exactly. Faith causes us to believe because if, if you're basing what you believe on what you see, every time what you see changes, then your faith changes. I see somebody get healed and I go, oh my goodness, God is a healer. I saw somebody get healed. Then I go to the next service. Nobody gets healed. This guy that had cancer died two days later. He didn't get healed. So if my faith is based on what I see, it's going to change every time I see something. If it's good, it goes up. If it's not good, it goes down. So my faith has to rest. You understand the rest of God? God is trying to bring us into a place of rest. And on the sixth day, God created man. On the seventh day, he entered rest. God created man to rest. Do you understand that? God created man to enter his rest. So, you know, we're, we're here to hear God, obey him, and enter into that place with God to walk in the power of God. God has a place for us to walk. He's created it before the foundation of the earth. And he's saying to you, get in the flow. Get in the flow, get in the flow, get into that place with me so that I can cause these things to happen. Now, in Luke 14 and verse 28, it says, For which of you intended to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, do you hear what he said? That last statement says, what does it say? So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Why? Uh, everything that I have, you know, is temporary. Um, it, it's like I've heard this over and over, and it always sticks with me that, uh, you know, all the great... Uh, the, the, great wealth makers of America that started, John D. Rockefeller and all of that group, uh, when they died, uh, you know how much money they left? All of it. <laughs> you can't take any with you. So uh, you understand that uh, there is nothing that we carry with us except what we carry in the Spirit. So what is important? What is important is getting into that place with God, into the will of God, and walking in that place. Because in that place is everything God has for you. The, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace. Love, joy, peace. Love, joy, peace. Love, joy. Listen, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faithfulness. So understanding those first three if we just got those three, if we walked in love and had the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, and walked in that place of peace, just think how our life would change. Let's look at your life every day and think about this. You want victory in Jesus? You want victory in the kingdom of God? 
Begin to ask the Holy Spirit to bring you into that place. Bring you into that place. Bring you into that place. Carry you into that place. Because when you become willing and do what He said, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that He has cannot be my disciple. And does that mean that we, we uh, uh, say, well, I don't like my wife, so I'm going to run away. I don't like my husband, so I'm going to run away. I don't, uh, these children are aggravating, so I'm going to leave them. It's not talking about that, is it? He's talking about forsaking those things that bind us, that keep us in that place, that keep us from growing and coming into the things that God has for us. He's talking about something totally different here. Now, when we start looking at the, at the, the, the children of Israel, and as they went into the promised land, uh, as they prepared to go in, and see, this is the thing, we're, we're in a preparation period, all of us are in a preparation period to enter into that place eternally. We're preparing to enter in eternally. Uh, we've already entered in, if we are in the place that God called us to be, we're already entered in to the spiritual realm. We're already there. But we have not completed that until we leave this physical body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So this physical body has to stay because it's no good in there. Who wants to carry their physical body in there? Ever, anybody ever have a headache or a problem in your body? No, we don't want to carry this body, do we? We want that body that does not have any pain, that has no sickness, that there's never any, any headaches, there's never any problems, no stomach aches, back aches, no problems at all. We, you know, we want that spiritual body. Well, God is saying in the kingdom, I've given you a place to walk here in the earth. In the kingdom of God, he said, pray this way, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done here on earth, as it is in heaven. So what's my prayer? That I begin to walk in that place in the kingdom here and now. I'm not waiting and waiting. Oh my goodness, one day, uh, some glad morning, we'll all fly away and we'll all be there. You know, we sung that song. And, you know, and we used to say this, that the same song, second verse, just as loud and just as worse. Uh, you know, we... We, uh, I, I grew up in the church and I saw and heard and and I, I was not convinced that this is what I wanted to do. And so it took me a long time to, to, to come back into the things of God to understand uh, what I saw has nothing to do with what God is trying to do. You understand God is bringing His kingdom here on earth now. He said, I want my kingdom to come here like it is in heaven. So what's our position in that. Our position is to do everything we can to see that that happens. Now, when they when they went across, when they decided that we need to go uh, into the into the to promised land, they sent Joshua sent two spies. And they go into Jericho and they go to the house of a harlot, Rahab. Well, uh, you know, uh, they, they get to see everything, they look around, and, but then uh, they find out, the, the, the government finds out, hey, we got some spies here. So they begin to look, and she hides them on the reef under flat. She covers them up. And then um, we're looking at a type of what happens to us in the kingdom. Okay, look at this. Here's these two spies. And they're looking for them, and they want them really bad because they've already heard about these Israelites, how they've destroyed, everything, how that the, the sea opened up and let them through, and how they destroyed these other kings. They've heard about them, and the fear is there already of them. So they want to catch these spies really bad. So uh, after they left her house, she said, well, I, they left and went up, left up, went out and went, down, went up the road, and, you know, I don't know where they went. So afterwards, the spies say, look, um, we want to help you because you helped us. And so here's what we want you to do. We want you to take a scarlet thread and hang it out of your window on the outside, on the wall, because you lived on the wall. And hang that out. 
and said, everybody in your family that's in your house, in other words, your, your mom and dad, husbands, all, any of your family, everybody that's inside of that house, when we come, will be saved. Now, if you look in the book of Acts, the same thing takes place. Um, you remember when Paul and Silas were in jail and the, the, uh, her, the hurricane, the uh, earthquake took place and shook and opened everything up and they didn't run away and the, they led the jailer to the Lord and he said, I'll save you and your household. So, and he said the same thing to Cornelius, I'll save you and your household. So what we're looking at here is household salvation. You understand, everybody that was in my house well, what? They were saved. So it began that, see, everything in this old covenant is a type and a shadow of what's coming in Jesus, what's coming in Christ. So they said, if you'll hang the scarlet thread out the window, everybody that's in that house will be saved. And here, the first person, after they went into the promised land, the first person that, that God saved was what? Oh, I'm sorry. She was a harlot. Yeah. The first person God saved was a harlot. It was he, he didn't go, they didn't go in and try to find somebody that was a good person and a Christian, did they? He he went to this woman because it was a type and a shadow of what was coming in Christ. That Christ came to save all. Not just a few or not just some, but everybody. The, the, in other words, the gospel is there and it's free and it's for everyone. Um, and we know that this is what happened when they entered, that household was saved. The people in that house were saved. Okay, what did, what did Joshua say? What did Joshua do when, when, they, were, when they were entering? What, in other words, what was going on there? Uh, Joshua told them, he said, uh, set apart yourself, sanctify yourself because um, tomorrow we fix them to go into the land. Sanctify yourself. Now, how are we sanctified? What does sanctification mean? It means separation from secular sinfulness. A setting apart for sacred purposes. Now, that old sanctification, see, they had to do that. In other words, they had to, under the law, they had rituals and things they had to do to separate themselves, to sanctify themselves. Now, how are we sanctified today? Well, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 6 11 says we're sanctified by the Spirit of God. In other words, God sanctifies us. Um, that sanctification is not a work of the flesh, it's a work of the Spirit. In the Old Covenant, what happened? It had to be first the flesh, then the spiritual. In the New Covenant, it's first the spiritual, then it manifests in the flesh. We see it. So understanding this is really understanding how sanctification takes place. Now, they were set apart before crossing over the Jordan. They were set apart before they crossed over. Now, now, what does this do? Now listen to what he said. Uh, in Joshua 3, 5, he said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So when we enter into that place where we understand that we are sanctified by the Word of God in prayer, we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God, then we're in a position for God to do wonders. In other words, they position themselves in a place to see the wonders of God. And, uh, you know, it's not based on us, but everything in the Word of God is positional. In other words, we, we position ourselves and put ourselves in that place for God to move in our lives. We put ourselves in that place and we have a choice to make. We, we, 
said this over and over. He said, I've called heaven and earth as a witness against you this day, and I've set before you blessings and cursings and life and death. But I say, choose life. So everything that happens in us, we have a choice, don't we? So we have to make decisions based on what God is doing and what He's saying to us. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So we have to understand that. And it says that when when they crossed over what happened, they saw they saw wonders, didn't they? They saw wonders. Now, the first thing we have to do is, is enter by faith. Now, the previous bearers of the ark, now what happened is Joshua said, I want the priest to take the ark and I want them to go before the people. In other words, Jesus is representative of him going before the people. And I want them to go into the water. Now, the, the water was at flood stage. It was way out of the bank. Can you imagine a raging river way out of the bank? And you're, you know, and the priests are said, okay, you take that ark on your shoulders, you know, they carried them on staffs on their shoulders, and you, you walk out into the water. Now, the waters did not part until they walked in. As they walked in, the waters parted. Now, what does that represent? That represents us acting out by faith in what God says before we see it. They didn't see the waters part and then walk out in there. They walked out in there and the waters parted. So a lot of times we're trying to force God to, you know, let me see it and then I'll, you know, let me see this, Lord. Let me see this, this. You're not going to see anything by faith until you move by faith in the natural. Then what's going to happen? You're going to see the manifestation of it in the spiritual and it's going to come to be visible to everybody. Now, and, and see that because that before the sons of Kohath bore the ark, now he says, I, I want the priest to bear it. So here we are, we're entering into a new thing. A change is taking place. There's a change taking place. And what happens in the new covenant is there's a change taking place. We have a new high priest, don't we? We don't have a fleshly priest any longer. We have a high priest named Jesus who's gone on before us and prepared the way. And he has all truth in him. Not like the earthly priest. He has all truth and all knowledge and all understanding. And he's willing to share it with us. Now, what happened to, to me in the past, because I didn't, I didn't understand um, everything I thought I did, so I came up with a lot of formulas. A lot of, you know, if you do it this, then God will do this. If you do this, God will do this. No. If God says do that, then He has a plan. So you just do that. And in other words, uh, is it based on me? If it's based on me, then I have to do something to get Him to do something. It's not based on me. It's based on faith in Him. It's based on faith in Christ. It's based on Him, not me. If, I, if it was based on me, it's going to fail right away. You can just count on faith. <laughs> it's going to fall under. Now, where where they where in, in my beginning, I relied on formulas. I, uh, you know, uh, I entered into the faith movement back in the eighties, the early eighties, and and I, you know, I, I was uh, in line to to figure out everything because if you do this, then God has to do this. If you say this, God has to do that. And it took me a while to figure out this don't, you know, we have to have faith, but it don't work that way because it's not about me, it's about Him. When I make it about me, we, I, it always failed. Now, in the wilderness, they saw miracles and then acted. You remember, in the wilderness, they saw miracles, then they acted. But now, in the, in the Spirit, in the promised land, we have to act first to see the miracle. You understand that? In other words, God says, I want you to go do this. You go do it. You don't see anything. There's no, I don't see any fruit of this. I, I, I don't understand, God. But we have to do it by faith if God is saying do it. In other words, we do this by faith. Why? Because that's where the blessing is. 
That's where the peace is. If, if I'm obeying God, He said, I'll, I'll give you that peace. I'll grant to you those things. I'll give you those things. Now, in John 10, 4, it says, When He putteth forth His own sheep, He goes before them. And the sheep follow Him, for they know His voice. So, what's important? What's important? Yeah. Hearing what he's saying, coming into that place, and see, a lot of people will say to me, "I, I, I just don't, I, I don't hear him. I don't hear him." Well, if you will come into that place, if you will come into that place with God, and you will seek Him, then you'll come into that place to hear Him. You understand? You'll come into that place to hear Him. God wants you to hear Him. That's His desire for you to hear what He's saying. So when you you desire to hear him and you're saying, I don't, I don't hear God, I don't hear God. Well, what you what you're actually doing is saying, Well, Lord, you're telling the story. You're lying to me. Aren't you? He said, My sheep hear my voice. They, know, they won't follow another. So what is your position in this? You need to come into a place where you you stay before him long enough that he is speaking into your heart, into your spirit. And I'm not saying he's going to be hollering at you, hey, go do this. Hey, I want you to do that. But then all of a sudden you begin to realize, hey, I'm, there's some things coming up in me. And it, it's not necessarily a voice that's speaking, this is God, I want you to do this. But it's coming out of your spirit and you know that God is saying things to you. And see, that's the... That's the thing. He said, seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Ask and it shall be given. Him that seeks is going to find. So you can count on this. If you will seek God, you'll find. He said, if you seek me, you'll find. He won't lie. And he'll begin to speak into you things and you'll know that it's him. It's like the, the first time God spoke to me. And, and you know, I had never heard God uh, speak to me before. And I'm sitting at a desk writing a report in the police station. And the Lord said, go to your house, your wife's in trouble. And, you know, I, I heard that. I'm, like, I'm looking around because it wasn't a voice out here, but it spoke to me. I knew that's what was said. And so it turned out to be very true. And I don't go into the details of it, but I can tell you, that God is very, very able to speak to you and to speak into you what He wants you to know. But you have to come to a place to believe that you hear Him. You have to come there to believe. In other words, if, if you go through your life and, well, I never heard God. He never said nothing to me. You know, uh, and, and I used to hear this a long time ago. I, like I said, I was raised up in the church. My daddy was a Baptist preacher. And, and uh <laughs> I heard this statement, well, there ain't no ravens ever fed me. <laughs> you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, and in other words, faith was uh, after you did something, then God put faith on it. <laughs> so, but, and I'm not knocking any, any denomination or any people, but, but I, uh, I'm telling you, God has a better way than that way of, of believing. God has a way of putting His Word in you so you can go by faith. Now, now this ark that, that the children of Israel carried over, what what did it represent? What did the ark represent? You know, what, what did it represent? It it was made out of wood, but it was covered with gold. What does wood represent? Man. The gold representing God. And when we understand that that gold is deity, and Jesus was represented by that ark because he was man and God. In other words, he was wood and gold. He was man and God. Do you understand the ark represented Christ that they they were carrying? And when Christ came, what happened to the water? The water of the Jordan backed up. And you know what it says? It says that the water, let me see. If I can find this here. Let's see. Here it is. Uh, 
this is out of Joshua 3, 16. It says that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Al, the city that is beside Zaratan. You understand what happened? When Joshua crossed, the water backed up all the way to where? Adam. You understand that? The water backed all the way to Adam. And when it came down, it washed away everything all the way from Adam. And see, Christ was represented in that ark. When Jesus came, He washed away the sin of everything all the way to Adam. Everything in the Old Covenant is a type and a shadow of what's coming in Jesus. What, what's coming in Christ. And to understand that He wiped away every sin. Now Jesus didn't just pay for the sins that you did before you came to Him. He paid for every sin you're ever going to commit. Every one of them. In other words, that's a completed, finished work. Your sins are paid for. So, understanding that sin is not our problem any longer. What is our problem now? Disobedience. Obedience. In other words, uh, when I when I don't uh, obey, then I put myself in a position to be attacked by the enemy, to allow things to come and, and, and present themselves all around me. Now, if I believed every every jaw and tittle in the book, if I understood every bit of it, I could walk in total freedom. I could, you know, the, the enemy would never be able to touch me. He couldn't touch me. But, um, and I don't want to confess this, that I don't do that. So, but, but y'all all know, everybody knows that, that because we still have this, this uh, uh, spiritual man encased in this flesh, that we, we step outside of those boundaries some, and, and, you know, uh, if we will not allow condemnation to come, because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. What happens when you're walking after the flesh? You condemn yourself. God doesn't condemn you. He does not condemn you. Because in that same uh, Scripture in Romans 8, if you look further down in the Scriptures, it says, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. You understand? He's explaining that first part because He wants you to understand that it's not, uh, it's not your, your uh, position. It's your belief in what God has you doing. In other words, if you're where God told you to be and you're doing what God told you to do, then your expectations should be Everything around me should work. You understand? Everything around me should work. Now, does that always happen? Why? Because we got Mike over here, and you know Charlene over here, Monica. You know, we got all these people we're dealing with. Now, if everybody in the kingdom operated in this, if everyone operated in it, then it would all be perfect, wouldn't it? But because that's not true. It's not all perfect. So, what happened? Remember, you remember Paul was going to Rome, and God had told him, "You're going." And so he, he uh, he's under arrest, really. But you know, they're they're carrying him to Rome, and he says, "If we get on this ship, there's going to be, you know, loss of cargo and life. All this stuff's going to happen. You're going to be shipwrecked." And they didn't believe him. And of course, what happened? It, it happened exactly like he said, but what happened to all the people? Do you understand the people were caught in that just like he was? Everybody on there got shipwrecked in the waters, but God had mercy and saved the lives, it says. So, in understanding this, that mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. Mercy always triumphed. God had mercy and saved them. He didn't destroy all of them. So when we understand that, that God's mercy endures forever, He's trying to get us to see a picture of Him, a picture of Jesus that's coming that's now here. 
this living in us, and he's bringing forth his love. Now, in that ark, which represented Christ, was Aaron's rod that budded. Remember the rod? Aaron's rod? What, did, what happened to it? The manna that came from heaven and the Ten Commandments. That was all in the ark. Well, what, are, what are they? These are symbols of three types of sin. You see, the ark, what made the ark so dangerous that, you know, if you touched it, you died? What made, what made people die from touching the ark? It represented Jesus. What made it dangerous? It contained the sins. <laughs> Can you imagine every year the high priest went in and he sprinkled the, the blood onto the ark? And that covered the sin. But the sin was on there because what did Christ come to do? <clears throat> to take the sin of the world on himself. Do you understand that ark? When you touch that ark, you're talking about touching all the sin of Israel for all those years that Christ, can you imagine what that would be like? Instant death. Instant death. And also it represented that the people wanted a king instead of a priesthood. Do you remember? They said, we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king. And they refused to walk in the law of God. They refused to walk in God's law. And this ark bore representations of rebellion in it, just as Jesus carried our sins and bore our weakness and failures in himself. And it was a type and a shadow of what was coming in Christ. And because they kept their eyes, see, and this is what Joshua told them, he said, you have to keep your eyes on that ark when you go on cross. You're crossing the Jordan. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Why? What happened to Peter when he got out on the water and started walking? And the waves got big. He took his eye off Jesus. He took his eye off Jesus and began to, to, to sink and began to cry for help. So as long as I'm looking at Christ as, my, and the author, as he being the author and finisher of my faith, then I'm able to move in. I'm able to walk into the kingdom and, and continue to walk as long as I keep my eyes on him. The minute I look at me, I go to sinking. The minute I look around me and say, oh, this is not good, and that's not good, and that's not working, this, you know, that's okay, but this is not, and that, what happens when I do that? Um, did God call us to judge? Did he call us to, you know, call us to, to be a judge of any kind? He said, judge not, lest you be judged, for whatever judgment you give, you're going to be judged again. And, and, the, and the principles of the kingdom are what? 30, 60, and 100 fold. See, that operates on that side too. Don't, you know, we think that's just for money. No. It's for our life. It's for our life. So as we begin to walk in this place and we look around and we see somebody that's not as good as us, <laughs> do we ever do that? <laughs> But see, God's trying to move us out of that. He's trying to get us to see. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we recognize, okay, you know, there's not anything good in me, you know, except Jesus. All of my flesh is, is going to perish because it, it's not worthy to enter into the kingdom of God. But what I do according to His will, what I do according to what God is saying according to His plan for my life, produces something. It produces something. The minute that I start looking around and saying, this is good and this is bad, what have I done? Amen. I've done the same thing that Adam and Eve did. I looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is good and this is bad. This is good and this is bad. I become like God. Isn't that what the devil told Eve? The day you eat this, you'll be like God, knowing good for me. Let me tell everybody, the day you eat off of that tree and you become the judge, you become like God, knowing good from evil. But that is not the kingdom of God, and that's not where God wants us to dwell. He is the only righteous judge. And, you know, don't confuse this with 
things where you have to make a decision about what God is saying for you to do. You understand? We don't want to say, well, I can't look. Or well, should I wear this shirt or another? Oh, I can't make that decision. I'll have to pray for a week. You understand that there's decisions that we make every day, but they're based on the Spirit of God in me says, this shirt fits you, and it matches these pants and these shoes and this belt. You understand? And that's... Uh, that's something I, I mean, I, you know, he might tell some people exactly what they're supposed to wear that day, but I've not gotten that close to him yet. I don't know. Maybe y'all have, but I have made it there. But you understand what I'm saying? We're, we're not trying to say that every thing, every moment, second of your life, you should be like praying about, should I, should I wear my watch today? Should I bring my glasses? Should I have my pen? You know, these are things that he gave us, uh, and, and we call it common sense that we have. He gave us the ability to walk in a way that's going to be a blessing. Now, uh, because the children of Israel kept their eyes on the ark, they were able to march into Canaan and see the salvation of God. And Joshua 4, 16, I want you to see this. No, I'm going to go back and read uh, Joshua 3, 14. And so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And in 17, it says, Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. Um, and you see, what was it called? The Ark of what? Covenant. The Covenant. Okay. On the day, this is out of Joshua 4, 14, on the day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Then the Lord spoke to him, saying, Command the priest who bear the Ark of the Testimony to come up from the Jordan. Now, listen. It changed. You understand? It changed. When they came up out of the Jordan, it was no longer the Ark of the Covenant. It was the Ark of the Testimony. It changed. <laughs> when Jesus comes, it changes. It changes everything. It's no longer just the Ark of the Covenant. It's now the Ark of the Testimony. We have a testimony now who Christ is and who He is in us. And the name changes. Every time there is, every time that there was a uh, covenant made by God, there was a name change. Do you, do you realize that? Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Jacob became what? Israel. In other words, every time God had a covenant, there was a name change. So, when God, through Christ, came, and he saw Peter that first time, what did he tell him? You are Simon, but there's going to be a name change, buddy. <laughs> You're going to have a name change. You're going to be Peter, which is a rock. And when he sees us, it's the same thing. When he sees us, it's the same thing. In other words, he, he looks at us. He does not see us. He sees Christ. He sees us through the blood of Jesus. He sees us changed into his image and his likeness. You are, but you shall be. And I know it's all... You know, sometimes I look at myself and like, boy, you got a lot of work to do. Whew. You ever feel that way? But let me tell you, in, in an instant, like that, change takes place, doesn't it? When you make a decision, what does it do? It translates into energy. And that energy begins to move. God puts feet on that energy and moves to accomplish what he's called it to do. 
And when we're moving in that place, you know, when, I, when I'm moving in faith, I, uh, it's glorious. When I'm moving in my flesh, it's dull and, oh, it's so awful. It's, it's like, <laughs> I have, I'm carrying around the weight of everything. You know. <coughs> and when I'm moving in the Spirit, it, it's totally different. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, I don't go to church all the time. We're not talking about church. <laughs> We're not talking about going, you know, for an hour or two uh, once or twice a week. We're talking about living in a kingdom where constantly you're walking in that place and God's moving to show you how to keep out of the ditch. You know, you ever run into a ditch before? You ever, you know, slipped off the road and run into a ditch? Well, we, we've all done that. Uh, maybe not exactly in a car or something, but we've done it in our lives. We've made decisions that caused us to, to get in the ditch. But, uh, you know, that's the thing that makes us into, from into. And, and they overcame by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That's how we overcome. And, uh, you know, one of Clay's favorite scriptures is um, through much tribulation, you know, will you inherit the kingdom? And, and, and of course, see, that's normal. Tribulation, you know, uh, all of these things that happen is normal to life. We all experience it. Everybody does. Um, we've all had people who, in our, you know, in our lives that have died that we hated to let go of. Uh, we've all had bad experiences. So, you know, er everything that, that goes on is common to mankind. But God has made a way in all of them. God has made a way for us to walk in the, in the Spirit and not be brought down into a hole every time something happens. Every time something's going on. And God's trying to bring us into a place to trust Him more and more and more. To trust Him more every day. To, to, to come into a place of trust for God where you know, you're no, no longer looking uh, you're not looking for something bad to happen. Your expectation becomes God is going to do something Wonderful today. You see, what did God tell them before they, what did Joshua say to them before they crossed the Jordan? He said, sanctify yourselves because you're going to see something wonderful today. You're going to see a miracle. Sanctify. In other words, um, in Christ, we are sanctified. We're set apart by Him. And by the Spirit of God. That's what it says. In, in, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember where I read it. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. It says we're sanctified by the Spirit of God. Now, my sanctification is not based on me, is it? How, how much sanctified do you think this flesh is? <laughs> this flesh uh, this flesh can do anything. If you don't believe it, look, look over there at the works of the flesh. And it includes, um, you know, ambition and murder in the same, all that's listed in the same thing, works of the flesh. You understand it's all a work of the flesh. So why do you think that God chose Moses to lead out the children of Israel? What was Moses? What was his work of the flesh? What did he do? He was a murderer. He killed the Egyptian guard, buried him. God can't use a murderer. Oh, yes, he can. He doesn't use anybody. You understand, these things were, were put there so that we could understand who God is, that God is merciful. You can't do anything that He can't forgive you for and that He hasn't already forgiven you for. What you do does not affect His love for you. Whether you're the greatest person or the worst person that ever lived in the flesh, He loves you the same. His love never changes. 
It's never ending. And because of that, we have the ability to walk in the things of God. We have that ability. God gave us that ability in the Spirit to walk in His things. Now, when God brings us out of something, what does He do it? He never brings us out of anything without having a plan to bring us into something better. He never brings us out of anything except He has a plan to bring us into something better. When the children of Israel went into the promised land, what did they get? They got houses they didn't have to build. They got fields planted they didn't have to plant. They got wells dug they didn't have to dig. They got all the things that were there that they didn't have to do anything for. You understand? They inherited. They got all of these things. God gave them all of these things that they didn't have in the, in the desert. They didn't have any houses in the desert. They lived in tents and moved and moved and moved. They didn't have, you know, they you understand the whole life of those people that crossed over changed completely. It changed completely in a few days. Here they are. They're owning all kinds of things that they've never owned. And God has given them this land. Now, uh, how do we how do we come into this place in the supernatural. How do we do this? We have to see that any problem that comes in our life is an opportunity for a miracle. Any problem that comes into our life is an opportunity for a miracle. And you see, God has a plan for everything. And if we believe that we're in the place that God put us and that we're doing what He called us to do, then my expectation should be that God can do whatever He says. Now here, here are these people now. We're looking at these folks who wandered around and you know didn't have a place of their own, and all of a sudden, God parts the Jordan River. They go across, and just a few days later, they own a bunch of stuff. They have that. In other words, they go into a land and they inherit all of these things that God's given them. Now, did they have to do anything? Yes, they had to obey Him, didn't they? When they went to Jericho, what did they do? God said, walk around one time every day and on seventh day seven times and shout. And the walls fell down. <laughs> I mean, you know, does that sound stupid? Yeah. In the natural it does. But see, God has a plan, and if you'll follow His plan, no matter even if it doesn't sound like this, this can't be right. If you'll follow His plan, you will see the walls fall in your life. Everybody has walls in their life. You know that, don't you? But when you follow God, you will see these walls come down. You will see it. If you'll follow Him and do what He says, even if you don't understand it, See, that's the biggest thing. We want to understand. See, the, the root word for demon is kinesis, which is to know. So what do we constantly say? I want to know about this, and I want to know about that, and I want to know about this. And that's our own nature. And God is saying, you don't need to know unless I tell you. <laughs> you don't need to know anything. If I, if I hadn't told it to you, then guess what? It's probably going to be a mess. It's probably going to lead you into a mess. So, why is it so? Why, why is backbiting and, and murmuring and complaining? Why does that cause so many problems? Because it's loose the enemy. Just let him go, and just like a like a, a rat running around eating a little piece of this and running over there and eating a piece of that. You know, we can't do that. We have to come into that place to trust God and allow Him to bring us to that place of blessing, to that place He has for us. And we have to believe that God can do supernaturally in, in nature. Do you understand what I... We have to believe that. And see, a lot of people... 
especially today, they just don't believe God. They don't believe there is a God. They don't believe that God is, is still there. But we have to believe that God is supernatural in everything. And in nature, He can change nature like that. He can change it like that. Uh, just as the priest bore the heart, we also, as God's priest, and y'all, y'all, does it, do y'all know that we're part of the royal priesthood, a holy generation? We are all now bearing about His word. And it's supernatural. It's no longer just a fleshly thing. We're all bearing about His Word. And we all become carriers for what God is saying. We become carriers. Uh, I hope that anyone that's listening here today that has, has heard what we're talking about can understand that God is trying to move His people into the kingdom of God so that we can walk in the supernatural every day just like these people who read about did. That we're no longer bound by our fleshly containers, but that we start believing what God says and we will see the miracles of God. Do you believe today that God has, through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, has sanctified you? That means He separated you into Himself. And if you believe that, believe that God wants to use you to work miracles in the land. He wants to use you. Uh, what's He looking for? Somebody that has faith to believe that He will, and He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. In order to heal, the reward is great. And he's not trying to get you to do it on the, uh, the 36 to 100 fold scale. He's trying to get you to do it in the kingdom, which is supernatural. You understand the kingdom is supernatural? You know, we talked about that for several days about the, the, uh, the little boy with the two fish and the loaves and how Jesus took it. And first of all, he thanked God for it. And then he took it and he blessed it. Now, when he thanked God for it, that's what we do. Isn't it? When we, we, we thank you, Lord, for this food. You know. But he did something else, didn't he? He took it and he brought it. And he, when he blessed it, he brought it out of the natural into the kingdom. <laughs> you understand the kingdom blessing is so much more than the 30, 60, and 100 fold. The kingdom blessing is... That little fish and those loaves, the two fish and those loaves, ended up with 12 baskets that they picked up at the end. So God wants to bring us into that place where we're not just living in that, oh well, I, I, I sowed this so I can expect that. I, he's trying to get us to move out of that mentality into the kingdom of God, into the blessing of God, which is supernatural. Don't you want to quit living in the natural and move into the supernatural? <laughs> Don't you want to live in the supernatural for a while? God is moving to this. My prayer is that everyone who hears will, will, will desire in their heart to move into that place, to start speaking what God says, to hear Him and obey Him because He wants to bring about healing and wholeness and fullness into this world. That's why He came. That's what he wants to do. Right? Uh, hey, Lord, thank you. Thank um, you. Because we talked a little bit before the, the meeting there about how that when we repent and the sins still, we, we bring condemnation on ourselves. And, and it, it, I think the first part of the message there was what we were talking about is to get beyond that, we are finished works to see us as He sees us. Of course.
course, just as we've talked in the past, of how and those thoughts and those fears and depression, boredom, anger, and worry, frustration, all those things. And uh, I've done a good job of categorizing those, but then even to know that, you know, that, that I'm holding, putting condemnation on myself and, and repenting for them sins, but I, I, I really shouldn't. I mean, I don't have to, because that, that, that we are His finished works. And, uh, and I probably get that a dozen times in my notes over there, and it's just it's one of those, it takes a while for your lightning quick mind to catch on and, 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 yeah. and just to end the grass. But man, there's there's, a, there's such peace and joy with that. And just and I know that you, you most everybody knows the fruits of spirits and but you would love joy and peace and um, but um, to include all of them, their love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self control. Uh, great word as always. Thank you. Um, faith causes us to believe that the Lord stepped out with me today, along with the faith comes by hearing. I have never heard God speak to me until just recently. Never got to experience Thank that. You. And, um, Thank you. And I took it and took it to heart and do it as He says. That's right. I, I've never heard a uh, point that you made today spoken like this, and, and never thought of it, never been taught it, never, or, but it, it kind of resonated with me. It says, you made the comment when the ark came up out of the Jordan thing changed. There's no longer the ark of the covenant, it became the ark of the testimony. That's right. And that's enlightening to me because it put things in proper perspective that, it, that we are the walking testimony that's to. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I say this every week. Uh, but it, it's it's almost uh, only if we're scary. It's not coincidental. I don't know if it's meant to be or not. But every time I, on every Wednesday when I do my little morning devotion, come in here and listen to you or Clay or Mike or whoever speak, the thing that I wrote in my morning devotional fits right into what you were saying. And I'm gonna take a moment to read this. And uh, it says it's Acts seventeen twenty eight. You spoke about the, the book of Acts. It says. For in Him we live and move and have our being. God is in His creation and close to every one of us. Yes. But God is not trapped in His creation. He is transcendent. God is the Creator, not the creation. He created us, created everything. This means God is, is sovereign and in control, while at the same time He is close and personal. He wants to be. He wants to have a personal relationship with every one of us. Uh, we need to stay humble in God's presence, listening for His instruction. And this is, you, you were talking about this in a different way, but it's, it's talking about being humble in humility and being teachable and being listening to the Lord and let Him transcend us. True humil humility is remaining teachable in all situations, knowing God is so much greater and we have so much to learn. It's when we think we know everything when we when we fall in the pit. Amen. <laughs> that. Humility comes... True humility comes when we recognize that God loves us just the way we are. And that He will remain patient as long as we strive to become like Him in character, word, and deed. To delight in the Lord's work isn't pride. Sometimes when I do something, I say, well, that's pride coming out. You know? No, it's because the Lord told me that. And he, re he rejoices in that, as we should rejoice in it. As long as you know we keep it in, 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 in the content and context in which it was should be. To delight in the word, words, Lord, to delight in the Lord's work is not pride. It is a form of praise to the Father as we're following His His doctrine and His instructions. Who is proud of us every time we succeed according to His principles and His design. All the glory goes to Him when we do it that way, and that's that's what we should do. Not to our glory, but to His glory. Uh, it is because of Him that we can succeed. He is our great benefactor, our provider. And when we look at that, He's the reason we can succeed when we put our trust in Him. In business, you get in the habit of, like He said, 
you know, like as a management, you know is the right way, or my biz or my, you know, my views are the way it should be. And you turn into a, you demand things instead of a coach where you listen to each other, you respect each other, you know, you, you have a problem with that person, don't go to your neighbor and, you know, discuss it, you go straight to them. And in business, I'm not saying it's hard to walk in the spirit, but you lose sight of it. You start looking at the weights. <laughs> like you know. And I took him from this is walk in the spirit, listen to God, obey him, and will, the seven day of rest will come. When you just finally I'm saying, listen. I think that's it came out of this today was listen to God and walk in the spirit. We keep listening to God. Jenny, you have anything to add? Um, that was a good word. The only thing that I would say, I want to elaborate on in, in what Coach was saying, which is really good, um, is all these things that you you talk about, about um, fear or worry, pride, all these things, unforgiveness, anything like that, that creeps into your walk or your life. Um, the word clarity and the word list, you know, listening is for to pray that God reveal those things to you. If there's anything in my life, God, that would prevent me from an answered prayer. Like if you have unforgiveness in your life, you know, you know, God's not going to, you may not have an answered prayer. So if there's anything in your walk with God that would prevent you from hearing God more, you know, having that clarity about your walk with God, ask God to reveal it, and so that you can hear and be more in tune with God. That's good. Thank you. That's very good. Yeah, because on that one there, I vote, just in Clay's office, you know, he told me early on, that, you know, of course, thinking for your will to be done today, Lord, but if, if it don't start with God said, don't do it. That's truly seeking him, but then that's also uh, uh, you know, hearing him and, and, and uh, um, just as important following him. Yeah. And then that's where the you know, obedience becomes a factor, not your sins or lack of. It's hard to hear him when you have a lot of things clouding your mind, clouding your heart. You know, no matter what it be, if it's your finances, if it's your home, if it's your marriage, or if your your sickness. You know, uh, someone who hurt you in your past, or whatever the case may be, you have all these things cloud in your mind, and you can't hear. It's just like if you have a, uh, an ear infection, you can't hear because everything is just clogged up in your head. You got to get those out. You got to pray, God, get get all this out, reveal it. You know, help me, you know, to deal with it in the way that you want to be dealt with, and get it out so that I can have that clarity, you know, with you. And I can hear your voice and, and be closer to you and, and be in your will and everything that you want me to do. That's good. Father, we thank you today for your word. We just pray right now for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in, in the lives of each person that's here and each person that's here in this. Father, I just pray right now that, that your healing power would move out, would, would, would encompass those and uh, empower your people, Father, to speak the word of truth and life. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.